The title is yes. different in Sharayu, please. We see. What do you see? Yes. Title is different from what in the agenda. And that's okay. <laughs> please go ahead. Okay, perfect. So uh, I'll briefly give you the overview of small modular reactors, and I will be focusing specifically on the, uh, the design and technological aspect. So I know I'm standing in between you and the lunch, so I will try to be precise, and I'll try to deliver the message uh, in a very coherent way. So be with me for next half an hour, and we'll just go through this journey. I mean, I've created the slides also in a very modular, modular fashion, as it's uh, the slide on the small modular reactors. Uh, I was just closing my video because it was blocking my screen, so I might just close my video from time to time if it blocks my screen. Uh, so I, I was saying that I've created this presentation in a very modular manner, so you can just take a specific module from this presentation and then just uh, uh, understand a particular concept from that. So that's what I have tried to do. I did not also get a chance to introduce myself, but I'll take uh, two minutes to introduce myself here as well. I'm working as Chief Technology Officer with TerraPraxis and Lucid Catalyst. They're both uh, the strategic consulting firms. Uh, as well as an NGO. And uh, the main goal for, for my organization, which I'm working now, is to have nuclear deployed faster and cheaper. So that's what I categorize as the biggest goal for our organization, and that's what I'm working on. And prior to that, I was in the same team as Vladimir, and I was working in the fast reactor team as a nuclear engineer and then project officer in the SMR team at the IAEA as well. I will be with you most probably tomorrow. I could not travel today to Italy, but uh, hopefully I'll be there tomorrow to, to be with you in, in Trieste as well. Okay, let's go ahead. Uh, that's the outline of my presentation. That's what I will try to do in the next 30 minutes. I'll give you the broad definition of SMRs. It's always controversial to see uh, what is the actual definition of SMRs, but I will try to define in my way what I feel SMRs are, and then uh, I'm open for discussions. Uh, there are already very good discussions happening, and I, I'll appreciate if we have more discussions after this presentation as well. Uh, I'll talk about the benefits, that what do, the, what do SMRs actually offer? There was some comment on what are real reactors, what are the technological challenges. So oh, I'll talk a little bit on the technology side as well, that how this technology is same or how it's different from the existing nuclear power plants and uh, what kind of deviations we are actually taking and why we are actually moving towards an era of small modular reactor, that why they are so popular. I mean, what, what makes them so popular? And then I've chosen, I've chosen three designs, which are, let's say, in advanced stages of development in the SMR industry right now. And I'll just talk briefly, describe them briefly, and then touch on the aspects that how they're actually bringing some innovation. And the innovation could be in any aspect. It could be from the technological aspects. It could be from the economic aspect. It could be from the deployment aspect. So we'll see how it's bringing innovation in industry. Uh, I'll talk briefly on the applications because I feel that the SMRs, uh, they cannot be considered specifically for electricity production because we always talk about economies of scale and, and things like that, and this is also debatable. Uh, but SMRs have quite a lot of applications beyond, beyond electricity as well. And that's where the niche market that they have created for themselves and could actually uh, lead to a better path for deployment. So that's where I'll talk next. What are the challenges for this uh, path to deployment? How they will be deployed? And then I'll talk, touch briefly on what's next. So the global de development as well as uh, different uh, deployment uh, scenarios that you can expect. Okay, so that's the first module. I'll talk about the SMR benefits, key features, and then the technology. Let me also try to take out my pointer if I can. Uh, okay, no worries. I'll try to take it out later. So let's talk about the def definitions of SMR. Huh? So as I said, I talk about SMR in terms of three major things. One is the size. So that's what small model reactor. So by size, my impression is that it should have a smaller land footprint, and it be, might not be necessarily footprint for <coughs> megawatt or per kilowatt of, of, of electricity or, or energy being produced, but a smaller footprint. And this should be typically less than 300 megawatt electrical. So I have used the word typically here because I don't want to put a strict limit of anything less than 300 megawatt is SMRs, so anything beyond that is a medium size or, or, or anything else. So for me, small is, which has a smaller land footprint. Uh, it should be compact and fairly simplified design. So that's what I mean by small, because when you make small, you cannot just make it small and complex, because that's what we have already done. The nuclear industry has already made large and complex uh, nuclear power plants. I mean, how the evolu evolution actually happened is that if you will see the graph of the first, even the pressurized water reactors that were built were smaller. And that could be because we were also understanding the technology and we did not want to produce 
high power from this, uh, uh, let's say, uh, from this equipment or, or small machine. So eventually, we used a similar design and kept on increasing the size because we were believing in the economies of scale. That, and that's true as well. In certain aspects, the economies of scale will actually lead to better economics because with more size, you will just uh, get better economies out of it. But what it did to the nuclear industry in general was that we were just simply scaling from smaller to larger without thinking about the complexity. So we, we, we made large plants, but we made them fairly complex as well. The PWR probably is, is one of the most complex machines currently on the planet. So the idea for when we go to small is to go back to, to simplification, to, to, to go back to the idea of simplification of the design. So that's what we want to do when we go small. Now the micro reactors which are shown here are just a subcategory of SMRs. They are also typically uh, of the range of 10 megawatt electrical, and they have their own niche market. Huh? So, and that's why I categorize them together as SMRs. But micro reactors could have a very niche application which the other sources of energy could not compete with. And what I want to also tell you, I mean, one of the impressions that you take from this lecture is that when you talk about the SMRs, just think about them as a resource, as a source of energy, which also has to compete with other sources of or other sources of energy which are currently in the market. So. We always have to think beyond electricity production as well. I mean, that's what the nuclear can actually do. It can provide flexibility in terms of power and energy market, and that's where we should also exploit uh, how we can use them. Now, the next major concept is, is modular in this definition. So I define modular as it could be in design, construction, or the arrangement of power modules. So these are, like say, three types of modularity that can happen. And in my, let's say, personal definition, if the design qualifies two out of three, then I would like to call it modular. If it qualifies only one, then I would not like to call it modular. And modular also has a specific connotation to understand. I mean, AP1000 design, large reactor is also modular. Uh, now, without commenting on, on the design itself, but we just cannot dissect or bisect the design into four or five pieces and call it modular. That's, for me, is not modular. It should, the modularity should help in the process of construction. And that's why this two out of three is very important because it should be modeled in a way that when I construct it, it becomes easier to construct and not necessarily is just an assembly of the parts which is very difficult to assemble at a later stage. So not mindlessly cutting at different places, but very inten intelligently designing it to be modular. And that's what most of the SMR designs are actually doing. They are designing it to be modular and not like designing it and then cutting it into parts and assembling it. So for me, that's not, that's not modular. Now, what it does is that it gives the ability to fabricate the major components of nuclear steam supply system in a factory environment, and they can just ship it to the point of use. So just make it somewhere, and then just send it somewhere, and then assemble it. What it also does is that it will reduce the on-site preparation. So this is very important because most of the cost, I always say that a nuclear is not expensive, but building nuclear power plants is very expensive. And most of the cost that comes is actually from the EPC, this engineering procurement and, and construction cost. So the, so the big EPC companies, they come, they have a design, they then start building that reactor, and in the process, the design keeps on, keeps on getting some kind of modifications, and this just extends the duration of the first, uh, first the duration of the construction, and with that, it also increases the cost of the plant. So what needs to be done is that there has to be a reduced on-site preparation. So again, keeping in mind what modular is, and if it's not reducing the on-site preparation, then there's no point of having that kind of modular structure. And that's what my next point is, that it should substantially reduce the lengthy construction time. So that's what we have to aim. The aspect of multi-module is also very important because sometimes the upfront cost that you, you can put into the construction of the nuclear power plant is not that much, that the, the country or the organization does not have that much capacity. So they can start with one module and then as per the availability of finances or as per the availability of the, or as per the requirement of the energy demand, these can be increased. And this allows for these kind of flexible arrangement where one system or one plant can have multiple modules, but can lead to different uh, power outputs uh, during the course of uh, this installation. So these are, these are very important. But there are also some challenges. I mean, modular is not the solution to everything. Huh? Because when we are doing modularization, we are also doing some kind of standardization. So these components will be very standard. What we have to also understand is that when we make the standard components, and if one of the components has a fault in it, so that means the whole fleet will have a fault. So this is a very important 
lesson that needs to be learned that while standardization, we also have to do a lot of testing to understand that this kind of some kind of standardization defect will be propagated to all the designs. And that's what happens when you see a car industry. So car industry is a very good example where you have this assembly lines where all the cars get manufactured so fast that you're delivering hundreds of thousands of cars per day. But what happens is like you hear from different companies that they roll back or they call back a lot of cars because they have a defect because that's what happens. A defect in one during the assembly line is just propagated to, to, to all the cars. So they have to call them back. And this can happen to a standardized nuclear design as well. And there will be no possibility to call them back. So, so we have to be very careful when we talk about modular and standardization. And standardization. The other issue here is that we also have to consider that this is kind of a chicken and egg problem. So we need factories to build, to mass produce these reactors. So if you want factories which can mass produce, these factories will also be huge. So there's a big capital investment that is needed for these factories to make these SMRs. Now, without a demand, who is willing to make these factories is a question that still needs to be answered. That if there is no demand, there will be no supply. And if there's no supply, there's, no, there's not going to be any demand. So this is a supply demand uh, kind of a chicken and egg problem, which probably the SMR industry also is currently trying to figure out how to resolve that. Uh, the other part in SMR is actually the reactor itself. So everybody knows about it. So I'm not going to go for the definition of the reactor. I hope everybody who's coming here knows what a reactor is. Uh, I have been always emphasizing that we have to see SMRs beyond electricity production. And that's what this slide tells mainly about that they can provide an options for wide and versatile applications, which were not previously seen from the nuclear industry itself. So things like district heating, industrial process heat, nuclear desalination, even grid level storage, as Vladimir was mentioning about one of the designs from Terra Power, which is the natrium design, which can allow some molten salt storage also happening there. And there are several other uh, co-generation applications uh, that we can, and I will cover that in, in one of the modules of my, of my slides as well. Uh, <clears throat> this is uh, this is just to show that when we talk about SMRs, and as, as I already said, we have to think them think about them as a nuclear power system. Uh, currently, the nuclear power plants, or let's say most of the nuclear power plants currently are just producing electricity. So what do you see here are different options that the SMRs could be used for. I mean, we can connect to the grid as all other plants are being connected, but then we have to understand whether this whole power system can be cost competitive to other sources of energy that are currently in the market. If not, then nobody's gonna use it. So we have to make sure that this happens. Same goes with another line, which is say going to the non-electrical applications. So whether in this ecosystem, they can be competitive to others or not. If yes, then only they're gonna go ahead. Other niche applications like the industrial applications or sometimes also in the remote locations. I mean, one of the recent examples that we call, let's say the first SMR is the Academic Lomonosov project, which is actually giving heat also to the district of Pavik. So it's a, it's a very good application of SMRs. It could be expensive than the competing, but it has its own market because it's in the remote location providing heat application where sun might not be shining all the time, wind, wind might not be blowing all the time, and the diesel generators could be very expensive for the fuel to transport. So they have created their own environment. And I think with more production, this could also be cost competitive as well. So this is what we have to see when we when we talk about the SMRs, that where do they actually fit? Huh? So the approach has to be more customer centric, understand where the demand is, and then produce the application and then produce the right solution for that kind of application. Uh, so now coming to the technology side, SMRs are, are not new. Huh? So you will see, see that in, in one of my slides, in one of my coming slides as well. So the technology has been existing, but let's say if we categorize them into different major lines, this is what I have done here, uh, basically into water-cooled reactors. So they could be land-based or marine-based. And the main reason for that is because they could have different applications, whether they're on land or where they are marine-based. The others are liquid metal cooled fast neutron reactors, which Vladimir also explained in his lecture a little bit. And this could be sodium cooled fast reactor, uh, sorry, lead cooled fast reactor or lead bismuth eutectic fast reactors. Uh, the main reason for development of these and which I will cover in my, in my lecture on generation four international forums designs is that they have the better utilization of uranium resources. We can actually extract, I mean, the current PWRs are able to extract a fraction, only one or 2% of the possible energy that could that could be extracted from 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 uranium whereas these reactors will be able to extract 
beyond 60 to 70 and theoretically beyond 90% as well. Uh, then the other technology lines are molten salt reactors, which also have their own market because of the high temperature applications and then the high temperature gas cool reactors, uh, specifically because they claim to be walk away safe. And I will discuss why they are called as walk away safe also in coming slides. And then there is this small market for micro reactors, but this is very much driven by the application, not necessarily by just producing the design itself. Now, these are the key attributes of, of SMRs. Uh, as I already mentioned that economics is, is, is always first. I mean, the, the cost will beat any other thing. So we, we have to make sure that they are economic. Otherwise, it's gonna be very challenging uh, uh, to deploy the SMRs. So what they do is that they have better affordability in a sense that there will be a lower upfront capital cost, but probably with some design configuration, it could also turn out to be a lower levelized uh, cost of electricity as the parameter is being used for comparison of different energy sources. Modularization I already covered, which will just help in the shorter construction time. There could be flexible applications, which can lead to wide range of users. And for me, users is very important. Uh, they have a smaller footprint that also leads to site flexibility. So what happens is that in case you have no or limited emergency, emergency planning zone, which is currently for large reactors is, is quite different depending on different countries, but it ranges from few kilometers to few tens of kilometers. Uh, this can actually bring SMRs closer to the community where the energy is needed. So this can have different applications like the next one, which I talk about the replacement for aging fossil fire plants. I think you will have a specific presentation on that. Uh, so if you are able to bring them to the existing coal site locations, then other than the bigger goal of uh, decarbonization, it will also have this flexibility of bringing the energy source closer to the uh, point of use. And then it also has potential for hybrid energy system because there is a lot of renewable integration happening these days. This is inevitable, this is gonna happen, this is gonna increase as well. But how can actually nuclear fit into this energy mix is very important and SMRs could have this capability of load, load following that will let them fit into this uh, hybrid energy system as well. Then I have put just one slide on repowering coal because this is the project that I also work upon. And as I said, we will have a separate presentation on it tomorrow. But here you just see a, a simple schematic that what the SMR application could be. So this is just a, a rendering of a, of a coal plant site which has been repowered by, by nuclear reactors. So here you see a series of small modular reactors. I don't know if you can see my pointer, but I'm assuming yes. Or I can try from here. Okay, probably now. So We can see, we can see no problem. Sir. Perfectly. Great, great. Thank you, Vladimir, for confirming. So these are like a series of SMRs that are applied here. So what, what has been envisioned is that there is a huge possibility to replace the boilers of coal plants and put this SMRs instead while utilizing the existing assets of the coal plant. So we can use the balance of plant of the coal plant. We can go into technical details, but the broader idea is this, that keep using the secondary side, the balance of plant, which is also very expensive. Nuclear itself is not expensive, as I always say. So rest of the part is already made. The, the design itself is not very expensive. So this could be a very cheap solution for repowering the coal plants. And this is, uh, on the left side, you can see this uh, uh, schematic which shows that how a standardized heat source system could be used. This could be anything, be fission, fusion, or geothermal, whatever you like to call it. Then we can have a molten salt or any kind of thermal energy storage system, which through which we can separate the nuclear island with the balance of plant. And then the existing coal plant systems, which could be the cooling towers, or it could also be the steam generator system could also be used. We can also reuse the existing grid infrastructure. We can use the existing road infrastructure. So this is a huge cost saving in terms of uh, deploying SMRs. Now this was briefly touched by, by Vladimir, so I will not go into too much details in this one, but this is basic nuclear 101. We all know that how, the, how we are classifying the nuclear technology by fuel, by moderator, or by coolants. The important thing that I want to emphasize is that we have deployed all of these reactors in one way or the another through experimental reactors, demonstration reactor, or commercial reactor. So there is nothing new in the type of reactor in, in terms of when I talk, when we talk about the SMRs. The only innovation that SMRs is bringing, as I said, is in terms of maybe some kind of passive system innovations in, in terms of deployment innovations or in terms of small technical uh, simplification. So that's what the SMRs are, are trying to do. And with that, they're also able to achieve high 
let's say secondary side efficiency, which is also important when we talk about sustainability or the economic cost. And then also leads to high temperature ranges, which then allows for, for multiple applications. Now, this is in terms of IAEA, not in generation four international foreign terms, they're evolutionary reactors and innovative reactors. However, SMRs fall into both the categories. And this is in continuation of my previous slide where I was saying that in terms of technical or the technical know-how or technology, it's existing. It could be evolutionary or innovative, or it's a combination of both. So SMRs are, are, are already there. Uh, this is again uh, agency definition to understand what are advanced designs. It comprises of evolutionary design as well as innovative design. What we have to understand from this graph is that the cost of development, we have to see from the right to left that as we move from innovative designs to current advanced design. So what's gonna happen is that SMRs which are classified as innovative designs which sooner or later will become current advanced designs because when we deploy or when we build multiple of them, we will not have to do substantial R&D, will not have to do some uh, confirmatory testing, will not have to do some kind of engineering testing and will lead, will we'll, we'll just remain with the site specific engineering and that will reduce the cost of deployment quite a lot in the, in the coming years. And that's what is called as that going from first of a kind to end of a kind, so end of a kind. So from uh, moving from technology demonstration to actual mass deployment. Okay, so with this, I move to the second module where I talk about the SMR designs. What I want to highlight first is that most of the information is actually available on this portal called as ARIS, the Advanced Sector Information System. It's a very authentic database because it's the vendors who upload the information on this database. So I'm hoping that the new version of ARIS will be launched by the end of this year, but please take a look at this uh, very authoritative and very accurate database. And most of my information is also actually coming from the information that's actually provided by ARIS. A filtered version of ARIS is this IES SMR booklet, which actually is published every two years, but also gives a very comprehensive information of all the SMRs currently being developed. And you can see that the number of designs currently being developed, this could be anything. And that, that's covered in my next slide that it could be a concept reactor, paper reactor, PowerPoint reactor, whatever you like to call it, or in advanced stages of, uh, of licensing. But there are almost 83 designs which are in this booklet. Uh, this has been increasing as, I, as you can see here, there are 16 more than 2018 edition and 11 more than 2020 edition. So this is in addition, so this is cumulative. So you can assume that there have been more than 27 designs from 2018. So in the last four years, you have seen proliferation of 27 designs coming to the market in one form or the other. And most of them have some kind of funding as well. A lot of countries are involved. So you can see this, it's not limited to one or two countries, but 18 countries are actually developing. Uh, you can also see the classification that most of the designs are actually land-based water-cooled. And part of the reason is coming from the previous discussion that we had during Vladimir's presentation that we already have a lot of know-how of PWRs. We already have a lot of experimental facilities. So why not just use that technology? Uh, but that should not be only motivating factor. And that's why we have other designs also under development for SMRs as well. Uh, you can find the downloadable version of the booklet online and it will give you nice four page summary for each design. And I was uh, one of the co-authors for this book. So it was an interesting experience also to work on this booklet. As I said, this is just to <clears throat> Uh, add to my point in the previous slide that most of these designs could be in any stages. So, so these phases of the design, they correspond to the activities which are being done during the design development. So the concept description could be only a paper design. Uh, the conceptual design could be an extended description. So you have more information than that. Basic design means that a good amount of marketing plus licensing application has been docketed. Uh, whereas a detailed design is like is nearly complete uh, documentation and should be ready for for deployment or, or for final construction permit in in a matter of time. So the final safety analysis report are done, uh, various site specific engineering has been done, uh, and should be more or less deployable. So in the booklet you will also find which phase these designs are. So you can read that booklet and find out which design is actually at which phase, and this will give you a good idea uh, on which designs you can actually see happening in the, in the near future or maybe by the end of this decade. Uh, this is just a review, as I discussed in the last 
slides before I go more into designs for, for each reactor, that they have simplification, they can have a multi-module configuration, they could also be underground to have some enhanced security and seismic uh, qualifications, and they have a lot of passive uh, performance to the passive systems. And this could also be debatable whether the passive systems will also work, but uh, as long as we can rely on physics, they should work. Uh, but there's a lot of qualifications done for these passive systems also to understand uh, their operations during the cases of transients. <laughs> there are more than 80 designs across all across uh, happening all across the world. And these are this slide just give you a brief overview of uh, regional overview of how many designs are happening, uh, are being under development. And this also gives an idea of the companies which are involved. And you can see it's not limited to one or two companies. There is uh, a lot of startup companies as well as uh, established companies uh, which are pouring into this market and everybody is very excited about the SMRs. Okay, now I'll move to the first example, which is the integral PWR type SMRs. I'm hoping everybody knows about this symbol, which is integration symbol. So what we are doing is we are trying to simply integrate this large PWR into one module. And that's what is integral PWR type SMRs. Now there could be some other SMRs or let's say water cooled SMRs under development, which might have pumps outside, like the KLT40S, which is called as SMR, has the pumps as well as steam generator outside the vessel. It is just a smaller version of a large PWR. I would be hesitant to call it an integral PWR design. So the integral means that you have to assemble all the components within one unit. And that's what some of the designs like New Scale or Smart or Karam are trying to do. So what they do is that they integrate major components within the reactor pressure vessel. So you see all the components like, like pumps, steam generators, or the pressurizer, which is here at, at the top, separated by a baffle plate. They are all integrated into one vessel. What it does is that it eliminates the loop piping and the external components, and eventually leads to the smaller nuclear island. And that's what the focus is to make the reactor small. Then it also eliminates the possibility of uh, accidents like uh, loss of coolant accident and, and things like that because there is no piping where, where it's gonna break. There might still be a slight possibility of loss of coolant accident through the uh, inadvertent, inadvertent opening of the pressurizer's relief pole or things like that. But uh, a large break loci is, is practically eliminated uh, from these kind of designs. There are certain other uh, features which are offered by the IPWR types of SMRs, which includes uh, the natural circulation, but this is limited to certain designs. Some designs are still going for force circulation. So when we have natural circulation, that means we cannot have a loss of flow accident. So it also practically eliminates LOCA as well as LOFA. Uh, then the control rods, uh, the, the reactivity control is also done uh, through the internal control rod drive mechanism, which is also another innovation that comes in, in IPWR designs. Uh, the passive heat removal systems uh, are also applied in most of these designs. And this could be done either through steam generators or some kind of heat exchangers, which could be submerged in the water pool. Uh, some designs like Smart and, and a new scale are, are, are deploying that kind of solutions. Uh, then safety injection systems like uh, passive injection systems, which are run by pressure difference. Uh, they also have some active injection systems, but usually the passive system should be enough. But in case of nuclear, there is always a set of redundancy that we try to have. And then uh, it allows to have some active uh, injection system as well and uh, various other, other safety features are, are, are implemented. Uh, <clears throat> most of the advantages I have already explained, but we can also look at some of the challenges because it's always important to understand what challenges this new technology also brings in. So there will be increased number of small bore piping connections to the RPV and the more number of connections, there is more chances of uh, kind of weld breaking or other kind of things that can happen with that or structural integrity. Uh, which is in the second point, which says the structural strength of the reactor pressure vessel in the joints. There could be mechanical vibration, there could be flow stability issues, which can happen in this kind of uh, long vessels because we need natural circulation. So uh, by default, the height of the core increases quite a lot. Then there is uh, issues of in-service infection because we are cramming everything inside one small vessel so we don't know how much space is actually available for in-service inspection for these instruments to go in. Uh, there could be lower driving heads, like low pressure heads for these passive systems. Uh, and that's why some of the designs, they use the uh, 
automatic automatic depressurization system so beyond a certain pressure this this ads walls they open and they just try to forcefully depressurize the system so that some of the passive systems could actually take into could actually start working so just to explain this more properly is let's say you have a passive system which works at 5 megapascal and your reactor is at 15 megapascal now you need to put that passive system into function but if the pressurization is happening slowly during the transient the passive system will not activate till it reaches 5 megapascal so what you can do is you can open this ads valves which is the automatic depressurization system valves what they will do is they will rapidly depressurize the system reach quickly at 5 megapascal so that this passive systems can then start working so there are engineering solutions for for that as well uh and then as i said there could be larger and taller rpvs because of this natural circulation requirement and that could also lead to the difficulty in transporting these now the second design that i want to talk about is a pebble bed type high temperature gas cooled reactor they could be either prismatic or pebble bed but i'll talk about the pebble bed design which have this spherical graphite fuel element which has the coated uh, fuel particles so i'll try to explain that through this graph uh, through this schematic on the on the left side this blue scheme where you can see this funnel shaped reactor where the pebbles are coming down uh, coming from the top and they are removed from the bottom usually they are they pass the core 15 times before they are discarded and i think the normal time from this this is very slow moving so it's not it doesn't move very fast so let's say this top layer takes almost one year to reach the bottom of the core so it takes almost one year to to reach there this uh, fuel spheres this pebbles are almost of the size of tennis ball they are 60 mm in diameter they are made up of uh, graphite and triso particles and each of this fuel pebble has around 15000 triso particles so these triso particles then are zoomed here and you can see that it has a kernel of uranium dioxide or some reactor designs also have uranium carbide so uc or uo2 this is a very small kernel which is then covered by graphite and pyrolytic carbon so what it does is that it also of course provides for the moderation which is required for this thermal designs but it also keeps the structural integrity of the pebble so that means uh, the triso does not break and then the pebble also does not break so easily so the fission gases are retained within this and that's why this design is considered as walk away safe because it can withstand very high temperatures and does not lead to release of any of the uh, fission gases from it as well here you can see some images of uh, probably one of the german reactor as well as uh, the, the the str10 reactor from from china uh, <clears throat> these are some design parameters from the str pm which is currently operation in in china this is actually a two module reactor each module is 250 megawatt uh, thermal so the net output electrical is 210 megawatt so don't consider this as 90% efficient they are 45% efficient but because they are two modules connected to the same system and that's why the electrical output is shown as 210 megawatt electrical so vladimir is it okay to go beyond 1230 can i continue probably sure, saying please, yes please go ahead yeah. we we will have okay. to leave 5 minutes before 1 pm okay so i will try to surely cover it keep, in next week keep some minutes. time for the questions so we have like 10 minutes more sure 10, 15 I minutes try to cover in next 15 minutes i'm almost done actually just one more design to explain okay so here uh, i will also try to explain that during my lecture on on uh, gif technologies but let me also independently explain here that what happens here is so the so the helium coolant in this design it comes as 250 degrees celsius goes up then goes through the, all the pebbles and comes out at 500 degrees celsius this is when we are using a steam cycle but if you are using a brayton cycle then this can be very high it can come at 500 degrees celsius as as inlet and go out as as 900 or or 1000 degrees celsius even so this can improve the out, output temperature from from the reactor if it's required in in, in such kind of uh, reactor configuration uh, and what you can also see in in this graph is the is the control rod so usually the the diameter of this reactor is very small it's around like 3 meters why it is done because it relies a lot on on passive cooling so for example in case of uh, an accident and you want to remove the decay heat if the diameter is larger what it relies is that it has got a large surface area so the heat will be removed through conduction and convection through the surface area 
that's what it relies on the passive system. But if the diameter is long, is large, then this can take a lot of time to go to the outside. So that's why the, the diameter has been kept small. And also because of this configuration, if you put the control rods within the table, there's a chance that they will get stuck. So one solution is just have specific uh, guiding tubes where it can go, but that has also shown its own challenges. The other way is to put the control rods in the reflector region on the sides. So where you see in this pink side, they are in the reflector region. So if the diameter is, is large, again, in this case also, the control rods work will not be that effective. So that's why we also have to keep the diameter small for this. So the HTGR vessels are re really, really thin and, and tall for, for the specific reasons of, uh, of the design itself. Uh, this I have already covered that they are very good. They have a very good applications for non-electric applications. They are walk away safe because the kernel is stable till 2200 degrees Celsius. Uh, and the operation temperature is not expected to reach uh, beyond 1500 degrees Celsius. So this will always remain the integrity. Uh, the gas coolant itself is very inert. So we move away from the problems of the coolant corrosivity and things like that. And there is also a possibility of a very high burn up because you can just keep on moving these pebbles in the reactor and can reach a very high burn up conditions for the STGR design. It of course comes with all of, it comes with challenges as well. Uh, it has low power density, which leads to large pressure vessel as you can see in this slide as well. Uh, and then the forging capability might not be available in all the countries. So this can limit the supply chain considerations and also for the transportation. Uh, Vladimir already explained that this has low density helium as a coolant. So that means it requires a very high pressurization if you want to move it through the core. So uh, approximately seven megapascal requirement is there. So we always try to avoid the pressurization, but we cannot do this in this case. The cost of triso-fuel particle is currently high, but we will see how it evolves. And then of course the licensing has not yet been done. So they will have its own challenges when it reaches the licenses, licensing stage. Uh, there are many developments happening. So there is a development for high temperature materials because it reaches such high temperature. So we need metals which can actually withstand this high temperature. There's also developments happening for having the Brayton cycle to just improve the efficiency more and also get more higher outlet temperature uh, as well as uh, various other things on understanding how is the source sum analysis of a high temperature gas cool reactor? What is the performance for STGR fuel? So these are all uh, ongoing research in this area. There is a range of STGR type SMRs that are currently under development and you can find that all in the SMR booklet as well. I have chosen just these five designs to show you that they could be either pebble bed, as you can see on the STRPM, or they could be prismatic, as you can see the SC STGR reactor design from France or, what, or, or this one from, from the Japan is also prismatic. The rest all are, are pebble bed. I have not covered the prismatic design, but this is typically, it's also quite similar. It also has trisofuel particle embedded in a graphite block. <clears throat> okay, moving next uh, is the third example, which is the micro reactor. So two examples were from small model reactors. So this one is, is, is micro reactor. So what heat pipes do is they, they can enable a, a simple plant. Huh? So they can eliminate the need for reactor coolant pump or the bulk coolant that is required to flow all through the equipment. And Unlike this high temperature gas cool reactor that we just saw, the, the heat pipe reactor is not pressurized, uh, but still can operate at very high temperature, such as uh, as high as 650 degrees Celsius. Uh, they are also naturally driven, but they can also self adjust depending on the amount of heat required to be to be removed from that. So this has, let's say, the self regulating behavior for, for load following as well. There are no reactor coolant pump, there's no reactor coolant system, there is no requirement for primary coolant chemistry control and all other auxiliary systems. So it's a beautiful system. It's very small, uh, very monolithic designs, but it can eliminate a lot of things. And for me, simplicity is something that's gonna help uh, the micro reactors quite a lot. So some of the benefits are they have excellent heat transfer rates. Uh, they're completely passive. They're completely sealed systems. So in terms of proliferation, they can also have some benefit. They can be transported easily from one place to another. They can be like plug and play. So it's, it's, it's kind of, uh, uh, a very niche design and it has a niche application as well. I'll try to briefly explain how this react, how these reactors actually are, starting from the image on the left. You can see that they can be of the size of a container. Then on the right, you can see this big monolith, which has a lot of heat pipes running all across this, this, uh, across this horizontal axis. And how they actually look, you can see from this graph, from, from this image, that this is how the reactor 
whole reactor will look like. And we can just take out one of this hexagonal element and then this image on the left shows that. So at the center is the heat pipe where the working fluid will go and it's surrounded by the, 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 the claddings as well as the, the fuel. So fuel here in this case is uranium dioxide, but other fuels could also be used. It, it can also be used in any configuration in terms of spectrum. So it can be a fast reactor or it can be also a thermal spectrum. The image that I've taken is from the E. Vinci reactor from, from Westinghouse. And this is a, a thermal reactor. So it will have some graphite blocks also to, to moderate the, uh, the reactor because it still uses liquid sodium as the coolant or, or as the uh, working fluid for, for, the, for the heat pipe reactor. Okay, so it has some design advantages, like it's very compact, can operate at high temperature. There is uh, no positive void coefficient. There is uh, reduced corrosion issues. Uh, it can be oriented independently depending upon how you want to orient the capillary. So in terms of flexibility of the orientation, that's also another benefit. Uh, there are some challenges. The working fluid could have high thermal neutron absorption. Uh, and that's the reason they are typically fast reactors, but there are configurations for, for thermal as well, as I said. There are some operational advantages. There is load following. It can use multiple coolant loops. It has fewer components. It has got fewer uh, operating parts as well. Then there could be operation disadvantage as well because the lifetime of the reactor could be smaller than the required. Uh, there could be lack of experimental data, which always comes into the picture and then and few other operational challenges that you can find here. <clears throat> now, these are just overall rational for why we are developing micro reactors is that it has a potential to meet the needs in energy portfolios where fossil fuel dominates now. So it's a very good solution for decarbonization of some sectors. So I will not call that the micro reactors are a decarbonization broader solution, but for some sectors, it can easily do it. Uh, it has uh, multiple applications. It could be used for electric and non-electrical applications. And the current development, you can see that all the major technology lines are developing uh, the micro reactors currently. We only discuss the heat pipe reactor from all of these designs. These are the specific characteristics which I've tried to com compare with the SMR uh, characteristics that you saw in one of my previous slides. But you can see that more or less uh, they are similar with some added benefits of uh, rapid deployability because they are smaller, uh, they can be transported so easily, so they have high mobility from moving from one place to another, and they could have much smaller radioactive uh, nuclide inventory, which could then reduce the source term, and then it also makes it easier to place it here to the end users. One important thing that microreactors bring is they have very small land footprint, which is two orders of magnitude lower than nuclear power plants. But you also have to understand in terms of how much in terms of production of electricity or, or thermal power as well. But I have been emphasizing all across, it's very application dependent. If you need something to be deployed in a very small source with a very high power density, then microreactors are, are a very good solution for that. These are certain microreactors which are under development. <clears throat> I have chosen some of them from the SMR booklet. And then here also you can see which are at uh, which stage of, of, of the, what is their status. One of the designs that I want to highlight is this one by Oklo design by Aurora, which is a liquid metal cooled fast reactor. So it's a heat pipe reactor using liquid sodium as a working fluid. They submitted an application to US NRC, but that, that has been now returned. So hopefully they will be resubmitting it. And this is also a proof that I say that if your reactor does not qualify, it will never be licensed. So they will have to qualify it for the licensing process before they can deploy it. So hopefully this happens soon and then we'll be able to see some micro reactor. There are other designs like Marvel, which is a kilowatt reactor that could also happen soon. There is another design called as Project Pele, which is a defense project from US Department of Defense. And that is also expected to be ready by 2024. So we, can, we will be seeing some micro reactors very soon. Okay, so beyond electricity production, uh, what I mean by that is that so far I've been talking about that we have to use more applications, but what do they actually mean? So from a nuclear power plant, what we can do is we can use direct electricity and do whatever we want. We can use electricity for some other processing plant, like we can do water desalination, we can produce hydrogen, or we can just produce steam for some other applications like steam methane reforming, which can also then again lead to hydrogen. Or we can also use directly the heat from the reactor and do the same things, which can actually deploy the heat applications much more than, than they can deploy the electric applications. So for example, if I take example of hydrogen production, it can also be done by 
electrolyzers, so we use electricity, but we can actually also use the heat directly to do the hydrogen production. Uh, for example, in some of the chemical cycles like SI cycles, we can use the heat. And in that way, the nuclear power plants becomes an obvious choice. So there, it does not have to compete with any other source because that's the only possibility to have a system which can produce temperatures beyond 800 degrees Celsius, some of the designs, and uh, the, the kind of uh, process that you're using also demands that. So it becomes a natural match. So that's where the nuclear could also uh, deploy into to, to other uh, markets as well. This also shows that how the efficiency could actually uh, increase. I mean, currently the uh, steam Rankine cycle is usually 30 to 33% uh, efficient, but by using the extra heat for other applications, we can make our power plant uh, much more, more efficient than it, than, it than, than it currently is, and it could also improve the economics. This shows the temperature ranges where we can have these non-electric applications. So you can see that this is the outlet temperature. So this bar shows the outlet temperature that you can expect from different designs. On the top, you see all the designs. So there's water cooled reactor, liquid metal cooled reactor, supercritical water reactors, all up to the very high temperature reactors. And then you can see what temperature ranges they can range. And based on those ranges, what applications can be used. So you can see that district heating or seawater desalination or petroleum refining, this can be done by any of the nuclear reactor. But if you go for some higher temperature application like thermochemical hydrogen production, then we might need temperatures which are operating in higher temperature range like HTGRs or, or, or gas cooled fast reactor or molten salt reactor. Now what I want to emphasize here is that this is not new. Nuclear has been doing this, district heating and water desalination for years. And actually the 71 nuclear power plants out of the fleet of uh, almost 400 reactors that we have in the world, they are already operated for non-electrical applications. So it basically has one more cycle coming out from the secondary side. They need a licensing approval for that. This has been done. So this is tried and tested method. And I also explained that the uh, floating nuclear power plant, Academic Lomonosov, also is doing heat applications is providing district heat to the district of Pavik in, in, in Russia. Uh, <clears throat> this is another example that uh, there are at least four projects which are trying to also use electrolyzers to produce hydrogen. So the other applications could be for desalination or district heating, but these ones are specifically for producing hydrogen through electrolyzers. Uh, this I want to emphasize that we also have high temperature gas cooled reactor experience. So there has been a lot of past experience. So this is again, not a new technology. So they have been test reactors. They have been demonstration reactors. They have been fully functional commercial reactors also. It's a mature technology. So if we need to use them, they are available as well. This slide just summarizes that uh, nuclear is not only electric application. The major output of nuclear is actually heat. We have been using it for electricity for a long time, but I think the kind of applications that require heat are also immense. And that's why in the global scenario, the electricity contribution is just 20% and the rest 80% is the energy, the other energy applications. And if you want to decarbonize that, nuclear provides a very good solution in terms of uh, raw heat, which is, which is very high quality heat that we can get from nuclear. Okay, quickly on the global scenarios, before I wrap up, this is my last section. Uh, this is just a summary of what designs are currently under development, and you can find this in the annex of the SMR booklet. So you can see that US and Russia are leading in the number of designs that are happening, that, that are under design or construction or different stages of development. But you can see that the other parts of the world are also working on, on, on different designs. Uh, this is just an estimate, and I will not uh, claim this to be super accurate, but this is based on the information that is being received through these vendors in public domain that when we can expect these designs to be operational. So KLT for TS and HCRP are, are operational, but we can see the other reactors also coming into operation in the coming decade. So by 2030, we can expect uh, uh, at least uh, these reactors. So two are in operation and these three, CARM, ACP-1000 and New Scale, they are in very advanced stages of either construction or licensing and should be operational in this decade. Uh, this was my thought experiment on what actually is needed for the development and deployment on SMRs. And you can take it with you in a sense that if you want to deploy an SMR, these are the major things. Like you have to understand the technology. You have to make a business case. You have to make sure the public accepts it's where it's required. You have to have all the legal and institutional infrastructure. If you're from a developing country or a nuclear newcomer country, which does not have a nuclear, and they want to go on a pathway of SMR deployment, 
this is something that needs to be considered before you can even think about it. So broadly, and this is my second last slide, which talks about the SMR deployment needs to be competitive. So for that competitiveness, the demonstration of safety and operational performance of the first of a kind, novel designs and technologies are a must. There needs to be a continuity of order. That means it has to be cost competitive against alternate sources. A robust supply chain needs to be developed. And we also work on, we also have to work on several financing op options that could, that could enable that. There is a regulatory framework it's already there. If it's not there, it needs to be developed. And there has to be different licensing pathways which can lead to the faster deployment of this. And most important of all is the nuclear infrastructure, and especially in the embarking countries. So that's my summary. I will not read the summary because this is just highlights what we have seen in the previous slide. And with that, I conclude my lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rayon. I'm sure you have many questions, so...